answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one of your question booklet. Section one. You will hear a conversation between a student and someone at an accommodation agency. First, look at questions one and two. For each of the questions, three alternatives are given. Decide which of the alternatives, A, B, or C, best fits what you hear on the tape, and circle the appropriate letter. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm looking for a place to rent near the university. What are you after? A house? A flat? A, a room? Well, preferably a house if that's possible. There are three of us looking all together. We thought we might share if we could find something suitable. The student says he wants to rent a house, so A has been circled. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions one and two. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm looking for a place to rent near the university. What are you after? A house? A flat? A, a room? Well, preferably a house if that's possible. There are three of us looking all together. We thought we might share if we could find something suitable. So, something near the university? Yes, if that's at all possible. We're all students, so it'd be good if we could find something within walking distance of the campus. None of us has a car and we don't want to have to take public transport. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> Everybody wants that, of course. Yeah, I suppose they do. Are you in your first year? No, I've been here a year already. Last year we all lived in a hall of residence. That was really great. Even the food wasn't too bad. <laughs> we had a lot of fun there, but in the second year they kick you out into the real world. You now have a short time to look at questions 3 to 10. As you listen to the rest of the conversation, fill in the numbered spaces 3 to 6 in the table and answer questions 7 to 10 by circling the appropriate letters. OK, so let me have a look and see what we've got. Uh, well, there's a two-bedroom house in Newtown which is quite cheap. Oh, that'd be good because it's very near the university. But if we all want our own rooms, it isn't really big enough. Too small. Give that one a miss? Yeah, I think so. Got anything else? Uh, what about this? Three bedroom flat close to the university. It's uh, $400 a week. Oh, that's too expensive. All right. Ah, well, here's something that might interest you. It's a three bedroom house with garden. Not bothered about the garden, but where is it? Near the airport. That's miles from the university. Yes, it is quite far, but it's reasonably priced at $250 a week. Why don't you go and have a look? Oh, all right, we will. Can I have the address? Right. Well, it's at uh, 14A Station Road, Botany. Is anyone living there at the moment? No, it's vacant. And does it have any furniture? 
Uh, well, it says here that it's partially furnished. What does that mean exactly? Well, there's a kitchen table and chairs, two single beds, a double bed, two wardrobes, a kitchen cooker and a washing machine. Not bad, really, for the money. Is there a fridge? Uh, it doesn't mention it here. I can let you have the key, and you can pop round and see for yourself. Right, thanks. We'll do that. Hello, you're back. How did you find the house? Well, not bad. It's certainly large enough, and there's quite a big garden. But it's completely overgrown. <laughs> you can hardly get out the back door because the grass is so high. We'd have to have it tidied up a bit before we moved in. OK. The kitchen is fine, but there's an awful smell throughout the house. Uh, well, the place hasn't been occupied for a couple of months, so that's probably why it's a bit musty. It'll be fine when you open up the windows and let some fresh air in. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the landlord ought to pay to clean the carpets at least. I can put that to him, though I'm not sure whether he'll agree. We can but ask. OK. Well, if he does, we'd probably be interested. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will now hear a speaker talking about student loans. First, you have some time to look at questions. You have some time to look at questions eleven and twelve. Now listen and answer questions eleven and twelve. Here you are. It was quicker than I thought, but I have to get this card stamped and return here to organise my fees. That's good. It means that I won't have to wait long either. How did you get on? What with? Oh, the food. Well, there wasn't much left, so I got you a cheese and tomato sandwich and water. That's fine. Do I owe you any more? No. I need to give you back three pounds. But I only gave you two. Oh, yeah. I thought you gave me a fiver. OK, so we're square. So what do I have to do? Go to the desk and give your personal details. Then they'll give you a card that you need to take to your faculty. What's your major? Environmental science. OK, so you'll have to take the card to the environmental science faculty and get the card stamped, return to administration in the main hall and organise your fees. And that's it? Yes. That means you're registered. Then we receive a letter with the details of our course where we'll be informed to go to the notice board or online to find out when and where our lectures are. OK. Let's have this bite to eat first. You will now hear a speaker talking about student loans. First, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 21. Now listen carefully and answer questions 13 to 21. Thanks for turning up today and welcome to this short talk on student loans. What you'll hear from me today are a few starting points, which should guide you in the right direction for what is suited for you. I'm assuming that most of you have an account at a bank or building society that you can draw funds from. These funds will either be your own or through a loan you may have with the bank. You may even have a credit card you can use. If you don't have a bank account, I suggest you open one with one of the major banks. It's the best option, as you will find major banks have more outlets. 
within the city and in close proximity to the university are HSBC in City Plaza, Barclays in Ragdale Square, National Westminster in Preston Park, and Halifax in Hope Street. At this stage, I just want to inform international students that not all the services available for resident students will be available to you. As international students, you need to provide documentation stating that you have funds available to see you through the duration of your study. Different banks have different policies, so search out the one that will benefit you the most. You will also need to provide a photocopy of your passport and certification of your enrolment in the university. The most common way of taking out a student loan is either through the university or through a banking institution. If you decide to go with the university, again you need to supply a certification of enrolment and passport if you're an international student, or if you're a resident, you will only need the enrolment details. One word of warning is that you need to be clear on the interest you will be paying on your loan. The interest level through some universities is almost as much as the loan itself. So, if you borrow ten thousand pounds, you might have to pay back close to twenty. Also, with student loans through the university, you have a limited time to pay them back, and this time is not flexible. You might have only one year. You might have five. As I said, different universities have different policies. This university, for example, has an interest rate of twenty-three point five percent. It's quite high, but not as high as many of the other larger universities. The other option is to take out a loan through your bank. You will find that most banks will have lower interest rates than the university. They average roughly between fourteen point five to eighteen point five percent. Banks also give you an option of over how many years you want to make repayments. You can basically choose to pay it back in a year or in ten, even more if you are finding it difficult. Make sure you have an account with the bank you decide to go with. Either a current account or a savings account is enough. With either of these accounts, you can use your card to make withdrawals and deposits from automatic teller machines at any time. And make payments over the internet if you choose. You can also use Maestro, one of the systems which automatically take the money from your account at a time that you have specifically stated, and deposits it into a nominated account of your choice. You might decide to have one hundred and fifty pounds taken out each month, and each month this is what will happen. Also, check what fees apply with what services. Some services are free of charge, but they are few and far between. Okay, so that's all from me. If there are any questions related to what I've covered today, please raise your hand. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a dialogue between two students, David and Jim. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-two to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-two to twenty-five. Hi, Jim. Hi, David. I'm glad I found you. I've got a topic for our presentation next month. What is it? I thought it would be a good idea to talk about glass and how it's recycled. That doesn't sound very interesting. That's what I thought, but it is. Did you know that glass has been around since as early as 4000 BC, when glass was used in the Middle East as a glaze to decorate beads? Is it really that old? Yes, and by 1550 BC, coloured glass vessels were widespread and used for cooking and drinking. 
The earliest known clear glass is a vase found in Nineveh in Assyria, dated from around 800 BC, which is now in the British Museum here in London. You know, I think I've seen that. I was at the British Museum a couple of months ago with Lisa. We don't realise how valuable glass was. It wasn't used widely back then. Until the 18th and 19th centuries, glass was very expensive and was used for limited applications, such as stained glass windows for churches. Large-scale glass manufacturing began with the Industrial Revolution, with the mass production of glass containers beginning at the onset of the 20th century, and glass light bulb production automated in 1926. How expensive? I don't know. But nowadays glass is much less expensive and is taken for granted as a packaging material, in addition to its use in windows and other applications. Do you know what glass is made from? New glass is made from a mixture of four main ingredients – sand, soda ash, limestone and other additives. These additives include iron for colour – brown or green, chromium and cobalt for colour – green and blue respectively, lead to alter the refractive index, alumina for durability, and boron to improve the thermal options. Annually, total glass use in the UK is estimated at around 3.6 million tonnes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 31. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 31. You're kidding. That's phenomenal. What do we do with all that glass? Where does it go? Using present technology, the UK glass industry has the capacity to recycle over 1 million tonnes of glass each year. And this, coupled with the material's unique ability to be infinitely recycled without compromising its quality, creates a compelling case for the recycling of glass. Despite this, glass makes up around 7% of the average household dustbin, and last year over 2.5 million tonnes of this material was landfill. How can glass be recycled? It can be recycled indefinitely as part of a simple but hugely beneficial process, as its structure does not deteriorate when reprocessed. In the case of bottles and jars, up to 80% of the total mixture can be made from reclaimed scrap glass, called cullet. What's it called? Cullet. C-U-L-L-E-T. Cullet from a factory has a known composition and is recognised as domestic cullet. From bottle banks it is known as foreign and its actual properties will not be known. Recycling two bottles saves enough energy to boil water for five cups of tea. You know, I wouldn't mind a cuppa now. Did you know that recycling reduces the demand for raw materials? There is no shortage of the materials used, but they do have to be quarried from our landscape. So from this point of view, there are environmental advantages to recovering and recycling glass. For every tonne of recycled glass used, 1.2 tonnes of raw materials are preserved. Recycling also reduces the amount of waste glass which needs to be used as landfill. I know. It's a social conscience we all need to have. Taking part in recycling the waste we produce makes us think about the effects we are having on our environment and enables us to contribute towards a greater level of sustainability. It's not all about economics, you know. I'm sure you're right, Jim. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear an orientation lecture on sports therapy. First, you have some time to look at questions 32 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-two to forty. Good morning and welcome to the university's open day, and to our lecture on sports therapy. There are two good reasons to be here. Firstly, you will experience what a university lecture is like, so take out your notebook and pen. And secondly, you will find out about the sports therapy program. Okay, so what does a sports therapy program involve? Everybody in today's society knows the impact sport, health, and fitness makes on the population's physical and mental health. Studying at Kent will develop your understanding of the ideas and issues within the sports therapy, health, and fitness industries. Sports therapy is one of the fastest-growing careers within the sports sector. The program teaches you all the specialist knowledge you need. In order to work within these industries, this includes scientific aspects such as anatomy and physiology and sports psychology. You learn how to design training programs and lifestyle profiles for a range of clients, and to understand the role of sports promotion and event management. The degree also covers the treatment and prevention of sporting injuries, and the importance of referral programs. There will be a full description of these subjects for you available at the door when you leave this lecture. Now, just to talk a little about teaching and assessment. The program involves taking part in and designing practical sports sessions, lectures, small group seminars, and private study. On average, you have six lectures, three practical sessions, and a one-hour-long seminar per week. And you also spend additional time developing your coaching and theoretical knowledge in real-life situations. At stage one, the first half of the year is assessed by 100% coursework and observed assessments. A majority of the modules also have written exams within the final half of the year, with the rest practically assessed. Stage two and three assessment varies from 100% coursework. To a combination of examination and coursework, usually in the ratio fifty-fifty, sixty-forty, or eighty-twenty, you're probably wondering what career paths you can take once you've completed this degree. Well, careers can vary from employment in health and fitness clubs, sports injury clinics, sports development within local authorities, or with national governing bodies of sport. Working in community leisure or sports attractions, self-employed personal trainer or sports therapist, there are some requirements you need to fulfil to enter this course. International students can qualify with the following: school certificates and higher school certificates awarded by a body approved by the university, matriculation from an approved university with a pass in English language at GCSE O level. Or an equivalent level in an approved English language test, passing one of Kent's foundation programs, provided that you meet the subject requirements for the degree course you intend to study, or an examination pass accepted as equivalent to any of the above. In order to enter directly onto a degree course, you also need to prove your proficiency in English, and we ask for one of the following: average six point five in IELTS test. Minimum six point zero in reading and writing, Grade B in Cambridge Certificate of Proficiency in English, Grade A in Cambridge Advanced Certificate in English, a pass overall in the JMB slash NEAB test in English for overseas students, with at least B in writing, reading, and speaking modules, a TOEFL score of at least five hundred and eighty written test. Or two hundred and thirty-seven computer test. If you haven't yet reached those standards, Kent runs a foundation course for international students, which gives you a year's academic and language training before you begin on your degree. Right, that's about it. Any questions? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.